Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, Javier, you want to complain about anything? That's my Twitter. So you know, anything you want, anything bad you want to say, it's there. Do you have any questions or anything? Uh, I'm going to be around. We have a QuestDB booth uh, over there by the foot. So just like you know, drop by at any point. That's that's cool. And I want to be, if in case you don't know, just before we start, QuestDB is fully open source. Apache 2.0 database. So I'm going to be speaking about about open source. And I'm going to be speaking about how I'm not really going to speak in much about QuestDB. The first five minutes, for those of you not familiar, I'm going to do a quick demo. But I'm going to be speaking more about the technical decisions, the trade-offs we have to do to design a database that actually can support a fast rate ingestion. I don't know if 4 million, 4 million per second sounds like fast or not to you, but that's kind of the thing I'm going to be talking about today. So why me? Why, why I want to speak about databases? Uh, well, I've been working with databases for a long time. I, w I was the early adopter of NoSQL, because when I started, doing the, uh, I started working with databases, SQL was not a thing you could run on your laptop. I was using DBase 3 and all those things. Then I was using like, different databases, like, I don't know, Informix, Oracle, then open source, luckily, MySQL, Postgres, whatever. Then I started using NoSQL because Hipster, Mongo, Redis. I actually spoke about Redis here. Uh, nine years ago, uh, I was using more big data, more things. I spent the time working for AWS on databases. And now, a year ago, I joined QuestDB because I really like databases. So in, in these years working with databases, I've seen a lot of interesting things. And I believe QuestDB has some things that are, if not unique, quite extravagant. And I wanted to share with you some of these extravagant things we have to do to make sure uh, the database is it's, up and running and working efficiently. So I'm going to be speaking about a few things. The first one will be about we are not Postgres. We don't try to be Postgres. And uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see why in a, in a second. Uh, so we don't try to do everything. We try to do only one thing. We try to work with time series. I will tell you more about that in one moment. Once you decide what you want to do, you can do a lot of assumptions about how users are going to be using the database. So you can optimize quite a bit about you know, how to model your storage, how to model your processing, how to model everything. The other thing will be, if you are into databases, it's a good thing if you start working like if we are in the 2000s. Because I see, I see a lot of people that are still developing like 20 years ago. Uh, hard drives today are not the hard drives we used to have. You can actually do very cool things. And, and some people are not taking advantage of those things. So we really try to keep on top of what's new so we can get the most of the hardware. Of course, the storage is important for you know, a database. And we'll talk a, a little bit about the storage. We are a Java project. More about that later. It's not your traditional Java, but we are Java. And we have exactly zero dependencies. And again, I'll tell you how, you know, how we do to have zero dependencies on a Java project. And that's about it. So first thing first, as I said, we are open source. Uh, we, are, we are not the most popular database out there, but we are not too bad. Uh, as of yesterday, we had over uh, 11,000 stars on GitHub. Just for comparison, MongoDB has 23,000. So we are not that bad. We are not paying for stars because we, we, we are 19 people in the team, actually 21 people in the team now. We are 21 people in the team. We are too poor to pay anyone for marketing. We don't have sales. We don't have marketing. So we don't pay for stars. We hope those are, those are organics. Uh, we are, as I said, 21 people in the company, but we have 114 contributors, which is, is not huge for open source standards, but it's not too bad. I mean, we, we, we have much more contributors to the main project, to, to QuestDB, to the core itself, that we are in the team, which again is cool, and we are Apache 2.0, which basically means you can use QuestDB for anything. If you want to, if you're a competitor, if you're a big cloud provider, an evil company, whatever, you can still use QuestDB. You can do anything you want with that. The only restriction in Apache 2.0 is if you don't like it, I take no responsibility. But that's about it. You can use it to anything. OK? That's, that's the uh, Apache 2.0 license. Oh, and, and you have to mention, this is Apache 2.0. But no restrictions whatsoever. Anyone can use QuestDB for free. If you want to pay us, we have now, as of two months ago, a managed version of QuestDB. But I'm not going to speak about that today. I'm going to speak about other things. So why another database? What, what you know, if, if at some point we make it big or we close, 
how we want people to remember QuestDB? Well, we want to have very, very good performance, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, even in smaller machines. A year ago, when I, when I joined the company, we were very fast in big hardware. <sighs> That's, what's the point? I mean, everybody can be fast on a, a large machine. So we want to be reasonably fast, out of the box, with zero configuration on a regular machine. We want to have a nice developer experience, and yeah, I already mentioned we really like open source, so that's about it. And the title of this talk, we call also say the clickbait of the talk. It's like ingesting over 4 million rows per second on a single instance. And you might be telling me, yeah, but I don't really need, I mean, who here is ingesting right now on your real business use case more than 4 million rows per second? As of today, there is always one. There is always one. That's super cool. Uh, uh, wh wh where you work? Uh, nice. That's uh, there are some people really need it, but most of you probably not. It's like okay, that's cool because you are not going to be getting that. What I'm telling you that we support four point something. That's a benchmark. That's a lie. That's like you know ideal conditions with a hard drive that never fails on a particular fraction of time, don't try to sustain that ingestion, using 16 CPUs only for ingesting data. 16 CPUs is not too much, but 16 CPUs only for ingesting data. If your data is not coming out of order, on a benchmark, artificial data, blah, 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 blah. But it's still important because if we can get over four point something records, also what's a record? In this particular benchmark, a record means 10 strings and 10 metrics, so 10 numbers and, and 10 strings, OK? If you have a smaller tables, it's going to be faster uh, because you're ingesting fewer data. If you're <laughs> uh, a, few, a few days, that I digress, but a few weeks ago on, a, on the public Slack channel, we have a user complaining that QuestDB was a slow. And we take those complaints seriously because you know, we, we don't want to, sometimes we are slow. For some queries, we are slow. But this user, he had a small data set. It was like a few tens of thousands of rows. And he was complaining, I have this data set. It's usually OK, but when I do a select star, it's slow. And it was like, OK. And after asking a little bit, he told us about the shape of his data. And, and he had like, you know, what we call white columns in, in the business, which, which is like, you, know, you have a lot of columns. I believe in this case, he was storing 20,000 columns for every row. And it was a slow on a select star. And we couldn't help him. It was like, yes, it is. It's slow. It, it, it is. Well, what, can, what can I do? But I was getting back to the thing. The thing is, uh, in this particular benchmark, 4 million records, whatever. So you know, uh, if you can be fast in guessing that, then that means on a small machine, you can be reasonably fast. So most people are not in I don't know of any user. Uh, I know you now, and, but you're not a user. Hopefully, you will be at some point, but not today. Maybe you're a user, and I'm very happy. But I don't know of any user in guessing. 4 million rows per second every second of the day. I know some people, when they are ingesting batch data, they need that. I mean, if you're ingesting batch, you might be ingesting billions of data points. And at that point, it will be cool to ingest 4 million per second. But in streaming, in real life, the most demanding use cases I know, I don't know everyone because we are open source, but the ones I know, they're ingesting about 200,000 records per second. That stops. And even with 200,000 200, records per second, you need to configure. It's not out of the box. You need to fine tune. You need to, you know, to do a few things. But 200,000 per second, every second of the day, we can sustain that. Okay, not with without effort, but yeah, it's it's doable. The thing is, you're not getting that. Yeah, as I told you, like, you know, blah blah. So before I start talking about more interesting things, let's just do a quick demo here of ingestion on my machine, which is totally not scientific demo, but you know, yes. To have fun. So I have here QuestDB uh, table. Let me just show you the QuestDB. We have a web interface that looks like this. And if I do a select count, this table not ha we have now only 30 million rows. That's that's it in the in this table. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start a Go script, and I'm going to start this script in three terminals at the same time. So I'm going to start this Go script in three terminals. This script is going to be sending 10 million records from each of the terminals in parallel. So let's do that. 
Okay, so now it's running, and we are getting logs there. Okay, where I have so this is the script I'm using. This is just a Go application. We are using the QuestDB client for ingestion in localhost, which is where I'm running. I'm generating some random data. I'm sending batches of 50,000 events, uh, and I'm doing this 200 times, so 10 million records. And I'm generating some like very simple data, like you know, uh, a device type, which is blue, red, green, or yellow, a random, a random latitude and longitude, one duration, and one metric. Very simple stuff. So I now, this, of course, the ingestion has already finished. Uh, I can actually show you a very stupid dashboard if I reload, where you can see that actually, I don't know, you can like, you know, query this, and there is some data here. Now we have, we have now 60 million records, not 30, which is nice. But for the part that I wanted to show you, I can do this in QuestDB. I can do this. They give me the timestamp, and we have a SQL extension sampled by. This is like a group by, but with a time unit. We go from microseconds to years, and you put anything in between. So in this case, I'm going to be sampling every second to see how fast I've been ingesting this data. And I can see in this machine, I've been ingesting data at a pace of over 3 million, which is actually quite impressive. 3 million, 3.2. In this one, you can see only 300,000 because it was the first. Uh, the first. So we, we, were, we were in mid-second. We were not at the beginning of the second when we started. But that's the thing. You can see we've been ingesting over 3 million records per second on this machine, which of course is a very good machine. It's an Apollo M1, has a local SSD, uh, no network whatsoever. So, you know, it's fast, but that's the idea. You can expect those kind of performance. But even in this machine, even if, if, if a very narrow table, I'm not getting close to the 4 million I was promising. So does it mean I am a liar? No, I just like benchmarks. But that's, that's, you know, that's kind of a thing, OK? So first things first, that's it. Uh, if you want, we, we also are fast for queries, but you believe me. If you, if you don't believe me, you can go to that site, demoquestdb.io. Or if you are too lazy, you can drop later by the booth. And, and I can run some queries for you on large data sets. Uh, the largest we have is 1.6 billion, which is nothing for many users of time series. But you know, it's large enough for a traditional database. So you can try what is there, but I'm not going to speak about that. I told you benchmark analyze. If you like to read about some of these lies, we have some blog posts published about how we run the benchmarks. But the only thing I'm going to say is like the benchmarks we are running, we use something called TSVS. It's a benchmarking open source tool which was created by uh, originally by InfluxDB. InfluxDB is a time series database. Is the the probably the the most well-known database for time series. It's very much about, you know, uh, about uh, monitoring and so on. So long time ago, they created this benchmark because if you try to, uh, if you try to benchmark a time series database with a transactional workload, it's very, it performs very poorly. And it's unfair because on time series, you have some specific patterns. So they created this, uh, this benchmark to send data in the shape of you know, time series and for querying data for time series, which is nice. Uh, a few years afterwards, TimeScale, which is another very popular time series database, also open source, they started to do better on the benchmark. So basically, uh, InfluxDB, for some reason, they stopped maintaining the benchmark. So TimeScale forked the benchmark, and you know, they have their own fork of the, of the benchmark. And we've been working with that for a long time, but eventually, a few weeks ago, we have to fork the benchmark because we had some pull requests that were not, uh, were not being attended. And eventually, after months, we have to create our own fork of the benchmark for time series. And basically, what happened was, which I think, I mean, this is cool, is like the benchmark was not fast enough. So we, were, we, we had one version of the database, and then we did some engineering, whatever, to make it faster. And we thought, oh, now it's really way faster. So in the past, we could ingest over 1.5 million records per second, which was already good enough. And we did some changes, and it's like, this is going to be way faster. And it was like only 2 point something million rows per second. It was like, OK, it's faster, but it's underwhelming. We're expecting more. After debugging a little bit, we realized the benchmark couldn't send data faster than 2 point something million per second because it has some validations, blah, blah. It's a benchmark. We remove every validation. And eventually, we got the, the benchmark to send data fast. And that's how we learn that we actually could ingest 
with 16 CPUs up to 4.37 million records per second, and that, that's kind of the idea. So that's like, you know, it, it's kind of funny when you are benchmarking your tool and you find that, you know, the benchmark is slower, it's like, yes. And then it's like, I just spent two days for this, but yes. It's kind of, you know, kind of interesting. So before I continue, don't use a time series database ever unless you have to. If your traditional, trusty, Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, even Oracle, or whatever, if it solves your problem, take it. That's it. SQL databases are great. You know how to use them. Everybody knows how to use them. They have fantastic support. But unfortunately, they are very generic. They cannot be optimized, for, and it's not their fault. It's that they can do everything. There is always one query that can give you what you want. It might be slow. It might be not efficient. But that's the thing. I mean, they, they can do so many things. It's, 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 it's crazy what you can do with a, with a relational database. So they cannot over-optimize for a use case. We, ob we obsess and we over-optimize for time series. You try to use QuestDB for anything which is not time series, worst choice ever. So no, no, that, that's the thing. I mean, we are super bad at anything which is not time series. So that's the thing. But databases are pretty cool, relational databases. So go with Postgres, having said so. At some point, your traditional database is going to break. Since ChatGPT, it was like, hey, ChatGPT, I'm super lazy. Tell me how, may, how much data I will have if I have 100,000 devices sending data every second of the day, how many data points I have after one day. And ChatGPT is very helpful. It doesn't give me a number. It, tell, it, it needs to show that it's a smart. It's like, I could give you the result, but no, I'm going to tell you. We have, I don't know how many seconds, blah, 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 blah. Eventually, in one week of data, we are going to, get the, we are going to be getting 60 billion, American billions. And not really like, you know, so it's only 60,000 millions. But yeah, 60 billion of data points per week, which is not too bad, you know, with only 100,000 devices, which is not really that much, to be honest. So that's kind of the thing. If you are sending only a data point every second, for a network of devices, imagine devices might be uh, vehicles you are tracking, scooters, bicycles, cars. It might be, uh, I don't know, solar panels that you are monitoring. It might be financial instruments that you are, you know, financial data you are tracking, users playing again on your application or buying something on your website, whatever. So that's the thing. The thing is, modern relational databases, they feel very comfortable in the hundreds of millions of rows. They don't feel that comfortable in the hundreds of billions of rows. Okay? No one feels comfortable there, but at least like, you, know, you, can, you can work with those things on time series databases. That's kind, of the, that's kind of the thing. And the thing is like not all the tolerance in data are the same. We are you are at right conference. You have a like lot of different databases, different data things that you can see about. So we are only about time series. So how do you know you have a time series data problem? The first thing, the obvious one, it's like you typically keep appending data. Like, you know, you keep adding data, and keep adding data, keep adding data, and eventually the data is, is going to be too big, and you need to decide what to do with that. What, I put always an example which is very stupid, but imagine I, I, am, I am the owner of Netflix. I'm Mr. Netflix. And, and it's like, hey, we have this server, and the disk is, is you know, it's very large already, it's very expensive, and it's getting full. Ah, no problem. This user, our first user, he registered uh, 12 years ago, delete it. It's been too long in the system. I don't know, you don't do that. You don't want to, to remove users only because they are old. But on time series, you do that. The value of the data typically diminishes over time. So something you do is like, as data is getting old, you need to have some strategies to move to cheaper storage, maybe archive, maybe delete, maybe delete those kind of things. Also, uh, it's very often the case that on time series, you are writing data faster than you are reading data. And you truly are doing something which sounds quite stupid, because truly it is. You are writing data at a resolution that you never query. You truly, sometimes you are writing data at millisecond resolution, microsecond resolution. But then on the dashboard, you have analytics for every hour, every 30 minutes. Why am I capturing data at the microsecond level? Well, just in case. No? There is an incident, there is whatever, but that's kind of the thing. You tend to ingest data sometimes faster 
that you read the data. That's totally fine. And that's something that you don't see usually on a transactional uh, you know, use case. A transactional use case, you ingest data once in a while, but you read much more than you, than you write. And again, that's interesting, because if your database needs to have indexes to be fast, I have this for you. You see the idea, yeah? The moment when you have a transactional use case and a relational database that they are fast because they have, they have indexes, that works as long as you are reading data often and writing only once in a while. You are writing all the time, and you need to index the data in order to be performant. I don't know. That doesn't sound like a winning strategy to me. We don't use indexes at QuestDB. We do full scans because why not? But that's kind of the, kind of the thing. So uh, I don't want to read from here because, you know, too many things. But again, when you are reading data, the other thing about time series is like you are interested usually on a slice of the data. You are not usually interested on give me the average of all the data I have. It's more like what happened in the last minute, week, hour, month, compared to whatever. But it's not usually give me everything. And, and also, it's only a few columns. It's not usually everything you have. And the data which is more recent, it's more valuable usually than the data which is older. And with all those things, we can start thinking how to design the database. As I told you, you very often need to resample your data. It's like, yeah, I'm getting data at the millisecond resolution. But I, I need to do uh, calculations on blocks of five minutes. So I have to resample or do something with that. So with this, we can do a lot of assumptions. We can say, OK, OK, if this is the use case, we can start making decisions. If we understand well the use case, we can start optimizing for that use case and for nothing else. So we are optimizing for things like, since the data will be, all the, the queries are going to be mostly around the timestamp. and you are not going to be querying individual records. You are going to be querying a slice of data. And you are going to be querying a continuous slice of data. It would be very cool if we can position at one point and then just read sequentially. So what we do in QuestDB, apart from partitioning the data in chunks so we can quickly go to the filter that you tell me, we, can, we actually store the data physically by ascending timestamp on disk. So that's why we don't use indexes, because the data is already sorted. Oh, but I want to query by last name. Use Postgres. We are not Postgres. If you want to query by last name, that's, I mean, it's possible. It's just slow. Okay? But we are not optimized for that, and we don't give you the option to create an index by last name. No, we are not that database. We are for this use case. So you know, you want this, this is what you get. So that's the first thing. Of course, that means when data is coming out of order, it's a disaster for us. Because we need to reorder the data on disk again and again and again. And we've been refining on that. Uh, over one year ago, we didn't accept that. It's like, you have data out of order. We are going to discard your out of order data. And some users were like, I don't know. That's too dramatic. I don't, if I'm sending data out of order. Well, but you get data out of order for many reasons. Just latency. You are sending data from different places, network latency. The one which is closer is going to arrive faster. So you generate a millisecond later from Australia and from here. You know, just you have that. This, the device is slow because whatever. So you know, it's not an option really to don't uh, don't index that data, don't don't work with that data. Then we had like another way of working with that. It was not efficient. Exactly one way ago, one week ago, we released our latest uh, release uh, 7.2 on QuestDB in which instead of having a single file for each partition, we have what we call partition splits, that basically now if we have data out of order, we don't need to rewrite the whole partition. We only create a smaller files that we consolidate. So basically now we can be performant and more predictable. In the past, with data out of order, we were not predictable. Sometimes it's very important to be also predictable, not only performant. So now you can know that even if your data is out of order, we are always going to perform at the same level. Okay? We, we keep adding those, those kind of things. So you know, those, those are the things. Uh, since we have the data stored sequentially, we can take advantage of all the prefetching that the file system is doing. I'll tell you later a bit more about that. But you know, the moment you read sequentially, the operating system is your friend, because the operating system is always trying to get more data just in case you're going to use it. So in this case, it's, it's working in our favor. So you know, we don't have to do anything. We get that for free. Most queries are not a select star. They are going to be aggregations. It's like, tell me the average, the maximum, the minimum, the latest, the maximum, the whatever value. So we store the data, of course, in columns as any other database. So we only have to, to, 
that's why some users can have 20,000 columns on one table and still have very fast queries, and they only complain when they do select a star, because then we have to open everything. But you know, if you have 20,000, it's like, oh, we don't care. You know, that's, that's fine. They are going to use a lot of storage, but we don't care. That's totally fine. Uh, then we have a, a specific thing. It's like on time series, most of the queries, they have some aggregations, but they are relative to some dimension. I want to, to, uh, you to tell me on this table uh, the maximum value per country, per device, per maker, per factory plant, per uh, financial symbol, whatever. So you have those things. And those things sometimes are strings. So we want to be a, a very user-friendly database. So I could tell you, ah, I know what, convert your strings to numbers. You know how to do that? Yeah, I know, but we can also do it. So basically, what we, we have a specific type, which is called symbol, which for you, it looks like a string. It behaves like a string. But when you tell me that a, a column is a symbol, what we do is, like, behind the scenes, we convert that string into an integer. We store only the integer, so we, have to, we, we can store very efficiently, not store the whole string. When we retrieve it back, we translate it to a string, so you always see a string. Behind the scenes, we are using an integer. So, you know, that makes your queries way faster because we are reading fewer data from the operating system. And also, as a bonus, we occupy less space. So you see the, the kind of things we are doing here. Yeah? It's, it's just trying to do things. For the same reason, once in a while, we create new, uh, new types. Uh, a few months ago, we, we have a big user base on cryptocurrency, because we are, you know, we are time series, a lot of users on the financial, financial data, and a lot of users in cryptocurrency using QuestDB for analytics. And many of them were asking to have some kind of UUID or something like that that they, they could use for the hash. Uh, they, they compute for crypto and so on. So at the time, they were using strings. The large strings for symbol were like too large for us. So eventually, we implemented the UUID type, native type. So we can have this kind of like benefits, like, you know, that we, we create types when it makes sense to make use cases more interesting. That's kind of the thing. Some of the decisions we, we, we take uh, take into consideration performance. When writing data, the same thing. Data is going to be continuous. So rather than writing every time, we keep like very small buffers that you know, we fine tune automatically. So we, have, we write data in two steps. First, we write everything into our, uh, into our data headlock. At that point, you cannot still query the data. And shortly after, we consolidate the data into the column files. And between one and the other, it takes a little bit. Typically, in the same second that you ingest the data, you can query the data. That's typically. If your data is coming heavily out of order, it might be the case it takes a little longer. And in the past, it was your responsibility in QuestDB to configure that. We told the users, hey, you tell me how much data I accumulate before writing the buffer. And then people were complaining, because you know, if you tell me after every 500,000 rows or five minutes, whatever comes uh, you know, uh, earlier, you couldn't query your data until five minutes have passed or 50,000 whatever rows. So that was, it was already there, but you couldn't query, you couldn't see it, that was bad. So, so now we basically have these heuristics. We analyze how fast the data is coming, how fast we can ingest, and depending on that, we adapt automatically. And the result is like for most users, in the same second the data is ingested, it's already available for querying. So we don't need to re-index or anything, and you don't have to configure. So we, we adapt automatically. Another compromise is like, this database needs to be fast for writing always. It's not acceptable that if, if, you, if, if you have a database and you start sending a lot of queries in a regular database, everything is going to slow down because everything is part of the same machine. In our case, we separate responsibility by CPU or by thread, depending on the model. But basically, we say, OK, we have a share pool. By default, when you store QuestDB, depending how many CPUs, we decide how many we are using for everything, and everything else it's a share pool. But we give you options to say, OK, I want to keep some specific CPUs only for writing, some only for parsing incoming data before, before handling to the writer, some only for querying, some only for the process protocol. And those CPUs only do that. So you can be sure, even if your database is under heavy analytics, uh, queries, workloads, whatever, ingestion is still reliable, is still as performant. So we separate, we don't, even if we're using hardware, 
we separate the responsibilities to make sure that we never slow down on writes because being predictable, it's very important when you're ingesting data. Same thing, uh, when data is getting older, it's not as important. So we allow users to say, I have this table, and all the partitions that are older than a particular date, I want to mount into a secondary storage. Maybe your, first, uh, your, your main hard drive might be a uh, uh, SSD, and the second hard drive might be a uh, magnetic drive. If you're in cloud, your main uh, hard drive might be uh, GP3 with max input and output configuration, which is more expensive. And then you can have a second disk, which is like a regular EVS with the default GP3. So that means when data is coming, when you're doing a select and you're reading from the cheaper drive, that query will be slower. But the other part will be still fast. You see the idea, yeah? That's kind of the, kind of the thing. And eventually, we allow to delete all the data. When connecting, we also make some decisions. It's like, we want to be easy to use, so let's speak SQL, which is not maybe natural for time series, but you know, let's add some extensions for that. Since we want people to use the tool, let's use the Postgres wire protocol. So if you already have a JDBC driver, PsychoPG driver, whichever driver that speaks Postgres protocol, you can send the queries and you can get them back. So you know, that's out of the box. But uh, of course, some other people will want to ingest data faster because the process wire protocol is, a, is a slow. So we decided to support ILP, which is the protocol that Influx, uh, Influx DB designed it originally. So we are using ILP for faster ingesting. We, we, we have clients in, in different languages, so you don't have to deal with that. But we have ILP for being faster. So for example, if you have the Telegraph plugin ingesting from, from Influx, you can directly point to QuestDB, and it works. So we try to adapt to those things. We are actually now in the process of creating an extension to that because it doesn't have like good error uh, you know, reporting and so on, but you know, we, we are trying to do that. Some people are going to be using us on IoT devices, Raspberry Pi and whatnot, and they don't want to install Python or ILP or whatever. So we also support queries and insertion with HTTP, which again, is not super efficient for streaming, but some people don't need that. They have a Raspberry Pi, and they are monitoring how my plant is growing. OK, that's cool. That's totally fine. Like, you know, just, uh, you know, that's, that's it. And we are not very, I mean, we are a time series database, but we understand operations teams, they are already using Prometheus. So we expose the QuestDB metrics in Prometheus format. We could tell people, hey, monitor QuestDB with QuestDB. It's not going to happen. So, you know, that's the thing. So we try to make things easier for, uh, for working. One thing that I like in QuestDB, I'm going to be a bit faster now because, you know, we, I have only 10 minutes. But something that we have to do often in QuestDB is we, we often have to say no because we have something in the team. It's like a new release cannot be slower than a former release. So we cannot add anything that makes the database slower, which is tricky when you are fast. It's like, oh, we would like to add this. And, and sometimes users ask you for innocent things. A few uh, months ago, probably, someone on Slack was saying, hey, I'm doing this calculation, and you know, I will expect an error because I'm getting an overflow. I will expect an error. Instead, it's overflowing and giving me, uh, giving me a negative number, which is tricky because I was expecting just automatic casting or an error. Postgres gives you an error. This user was asking for automatic casting to the next number. It was two integers, a multiplication of two integers. It was giving a long result. And we were not giving an error. We're not giving you a long, we're going to give you a negative integer. I don't know, it's ugly, I know. So we asked the team, hey, team, someone is complaining about this. Sounds reasonable to me. We could do auto conversion. And then Bolek, which by the way is with me today in the, in the booth, Bolek uh, told me, oh yeah, in the past we tested this out, but doing the automatic conversion to the next type is actually slower. So yeah, we prefer to say, since no one complains about this thing about overflow, it's not critical. We are not going to over, we, we just, you know, we just give you a negative number, so yeah. If you want to cast, you can put explicit cast on your query, and then yeah, you are casting too long, no errors. You know what I mean, yeah? So sometimes you have to say no. Sometimes when it makes sense, we say yes. We create new types, like the UUID. So we, we say yes to some use cases, but we need to say no to many things. For example, a lot of people is asking us about, uh, a lot of people ask about geospatial support. We have very limited geospatial support. We have geohashes as a type. 
we can tell you if one geo has or one point is inside of another, but we don't have proximity, radius, areas, boundaries, the things you would expect on a PostGIS. We are not Postgres. We tried, we still didn't find a good way of getting better geospatial support without being slower. At some point, maybe we'll have it. But you know, we, we, we added geohases instead. So we tried to compromise on what things we can add, which are good enough, but that's kind of the thing. And then some of the technical trade-offs, more lower level trade-offs. Who's here a Java developer? OK, oh, oh, a few of you. OK, OK. Who here knows that Java has the garbage collector and is terrible for that? It's getting better, I know, but it's terrible. Uh, it's important to be predictable. If you have Java stopping the wall at some point, even with the newer garbage collectors, it's not fun. So something we decided a long time ago, uh, by the way, the database is written mostly in Java, uh, with critical parts for vectorization, for parallelization operations on C++. Now we have some parts in Rust, but what is C++? We want it to be very fast. So if you have Java and then you need to call C++ for some things, you will need to pass the data around. And passing data, doing conversions, is not fun. It's a lot of data you are, a lot of time you are spending. So we decided to use unsafe memory handling for, for Java, which means use Java as if it was C++. Basically means use the direct direction of memory with Java. When you are calling C++ or Rust, just pass the pointer. They can read directly from the same address. They give you the data back on somewhere. You read from there, no conversion whatsoever. That sounds pretty cool. Also, direct memory mapping, which is a technique in which the same buffer that the disk in the operating system is using for reading and writing data is the one you use in your program without any conversion in between. That's super tricky. Andy Paolo, which is a very smart guy uh, working at the Stanford University, teaching databases, super smart guy, super smart. He has this, uh, in this, this paper with that logo. Are you, are you sure you want to use Nmap in your database? Because it's controversial. And some databases use Nmap. We use them. We know it can be very tricky. But still, the performance we get from using mem memory access management is interesting. So what happens? When you use direct memory access with Java and safe memory, the memory is managed by you, not really by the Java virtual machine. The memory is of heap. It's not in the heap. And all the standard libraries in Java are in the heap. Which means, oh, which means that we cannot use the Java standard libraries. We had to rewrite all the Java standard libraries that we needed. Oh, we need to do networking. OK, we need to write our own networking library for Java. We need to work with, charaster, with characters and, says, and with strings. Oh, we need to create a character class. Of course, we are not going to implement all, everything that you have in Java for characters, because we only use some of the things. We need to work with input and output. Oh, yeah, we are going to have to create an input and output like no, a class in Java. Uh, working with threads, arrays, rings, hash maps, hash maps of integers, hash maps of whatever. Everything has to be implemented. We have zero dependencies. Actually, it's not true. If you, if you look at the Maven, uh, you know, at the pond.xml, at the Maven file, you will see two dependencies. They are only for testing. JUnit and Postgres, only for testing. But we have zero dependencies. And the, the Java standard library has been implemented from scratch. Then we use C++ for optimizing for vectorization. So we can, we can run several operations, uh, one operation, sorry, on several memory registers at the same time, which is something you can do. That's only supported in QuestDB on IMD and Intel processors in my Mac, which is an uh, ARM. I, it's not working with vectorization. I mean, it still works, but it's not vectorizing. Uh, at some point, we might add in it, but not today. We have a just in time compiler that we wrote in C++ for our statements. Now we have an explain. We don't have it in the past, which is interesting. And these things, they, they are like, you know, they really work. They really work. This is a tweet of one of our developers. He's based in, in Bulgaria. And, and he's saying, you know, Another, this, this is the kind of things that I don't really understand. I would lie to you if I tell you I understand what he's talking about. But these are the kind of things like, you know, some core, I'm not a core developer, I'm a developer advocate. My, my colleague, uh, Bolek, which is uh, today in the booth, he and tomorrow, he is a core developer, but not me. But that's the thing. It's like, oh, if we want to uh, do a quality check on, on, on keys, we can use 
something with men CP instead of whatever, what not. And yeah, it's true, it's faster. But that's the kind of things we worry about, like very low level stuff that you take for granted when you are developing user applications. But in our case, it really helps. This graphic, I don't care what it is, it's just this was the before, this was the after, without users having to do anything, because we worry about this kind of things. So in the end, these kind of small optimizations, they really pay off for many things. I told you already how to implement the uh, Java library. We cannot allocate memory in the hot path. It's very painful for developers, but somehow it works. That's kind of the thing. And this is basically our approach to performance. It's like, we still don't know where the next opportunity to be more performant is, but we are all the time, you know, trying there, listening to feedback from you. This query is a slow. Oh, interesting, a slow query. Let's see why. Oh, it's because of this. We cannot fix it. You have 20,000 columns. Oh, it's because of this. We can fix it. It's because we have this optimization is wrong. So, you know, we can uh, also, like, we read, like, I don't know, some other people, let's say ClickHouse. They do something super cool. It's like, oh, how ClickHouse can be that fast? And then we copy them because it's open source. So that's kind of, that's kind of what we do. Like, you know, we, we copy everybody else. We are always in the lookout, which are the new techniques, new processors, new whatever, in order to be super interesting. And, and then we ask ourselves things like, imagine you have a 80 gigabytes file, which is heavily unsorted. It's larger than your memory. How will you efficiently sort this kind of file in an efficient way if it doesn't fit in memory, a CSV file. I don't know. That's how one cool optimization, I don't have the, the full story here. You can ask me later if you want. That's how one of the optimizations we have on the database started, because of some developer asking himself, well, how can I optimize those kind of things? That's, you know, that's a bit of the idea. I have a video that I'm not going to show you because I'm already over time, but it's just our CTO testing the reliability of the database by unplugging several times a hard drive where the database is running and seeing what happens. So that's like, you know, we also do things in the old traditional way of just simulating a failure. OK, let's just break some hard drives and see what happens. We are working in some things for the future. We don't know if we will implement. We are always testing. Some of the tests we do, they, they go nowhere. Some of the tests we do, they are super cool. So we are trying to do a few new things, like partitioning and compression and new vectorizations and whatnot, but kind of, that's kind of the thing. QuestDB is open source. If you want to pay, you can also pay. Cloud QuestDB. Uh, if not, just open source. QuestDB on GitHub. We like GitHub stars, and we like open source, and I'm going to be at the booth today and tomorrow. Any questions you have, more than happy to answer. Thank you.